Hey, welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Pastor Kim Wilcox here inviting you back to the table. A few minutes late getting started this evening. The computer decided it wanted to do an update. Uh, you all understand that, right? And so it does what it wants to do when it wants to do it. And so anyway, we are we're up and going. We are online. We're in session two. We're going to be in John chapter one. <clears throat> I'm going to bounce around to come up a couple other places as well, but uh, for the most part, that's that's where we're going to be. I uh, invite you back to uh, be able to share with us this evening as we uh, talking about our belief, our God-given belief system. And so uh, I'm going to jump right in there this evening. Uh, really no announcements other than Sunday morning. We're going to have uh, live service at, at 1030 on Facebook, live at 1030 in person. Uh, we invite you to Stop by, either in person or online, and join with us. Uh, we invite you this evening to share this on your Facebook page. And let others know that uh, you're a part of the study and what's going on with the study. And, and uh, as others get on this evening, be sure and uh, welcome them. Tell them uh, good evening, and uh, we're excited to have them as well. Uh, one thing I did want to start with today is 9-11. Uh, of course, 23 years ago today was the infamous day in uh, in our history uh, where we um, were attacked from outside and uh, lots of uh, lives were lost, uh, not really lost, but uh, um, to death that day. And uh, quite a bit uh, took place uh, over the next season of time, uh, but we are really uh, far beyond that now. We've got a whole new generation that's grown up that did not experience that, and so I encourage you to uh, join me. We're just going to take a, a moment of silence and then uh, you lift those families up in, in prayer. In the final this evening, we thank you for courage. We thank you for purpose. Lord, we think uh, 23 years ago today, uh, this nation was shaken to its core and uh, a lot of people sought after you uh, because of fear. But Lord, those things kind of resided and people are back to their uh, daily lives, or to the daily world. But yet there were a lot of people whose lives were, were lost that day. Uh, a lot of them had uh, given their lives out of service and duty. And so, Lord, this evening, we just want to take a moment to uh, honor those, uh, to thank you for protection and provision. And, Lord, I think about all the, the families that were uh, broken because of this day. And so, Lord, I ask for your comfort and encouragement still on their lives and uh, all those that uh, didn't have a loved one come home that day and so Lord we're just going to be silent before you I know the scripture says be still and know that I am God and so Lord this evening we're just going to we're going to do just that Lord, again this evening, we thank you for your provision of life, life eternal. And that even through death, Lord, we might uh, experience something far beyond what we can ever imagine. And Lord, I continue to lift up those families today that uh, their loved ones didn't come home. They didn't suspect anything any different than any other day. And yet, 23 years ago today, it was quite different. And so, Lord, we, we ask for your comfort still. We ask for your strength to be in the lives of those families. That they would seek you for guidance and direction. And, and Lord, this evening, as we look into your word, we, we're going to be in the Gospel of John. And, Lord, I know that you penned that so that we would believe. And so I pray that you give us insight and direction this evening as we as we begin. 
Lord, we have lots in our church family that are struggling with health issues and, and problems and upcoming surgeries and some trying to recover but struggling with that. And Lord, we, we pray for your hand to be upon each one of those lives that they can see you in it, Lord, and that we would that we would trust you for the way you would provide. And Lord, that we would use even these things to draw near to you, as uh, we spoke earlier. And so Lord, this evening we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. We ask that you speak to each one of us individually in a way that we can truly understand. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, again, this evening we're going to be in John chapter 1. Uh, we're going to have a couple other scriptures as well, but uh, for the most part, that's where we're going to kind of hang out. We're talking about belief uh, this evening. Last week, we talked about the Word. Um, I shared last week, for the Gospel of John, uh, you really have to have a, a full understanding of the very first verse, John 1, 1, to uh, truly understand the rest of the chapter. And so this evening, as we move on a few verses here, we're going to come upon this talk about belief. And so I want you to think this evening as we begin, you know, how do you form your belief system? You know, what, what makes you come to the point of believing something or not? Is it factual or you just take the word of someone else? Um, do you investigate it? Do you... How do you? Uh, do, do you read up on topics? Um, do you just go with other people's opinions? Or do you just come up with those conclusions on your own? Uh, the answer to that question is really relevant to you, uh, to the lives around you, your belief system is something that guides and directs everything um, about you. What you do, how you do it, um, all the things about you. Belief. And so can you Think about a moment in your life, or, or maybe a season of time, maybe, that that if you believe the gospel to be true, the, the good news about Jesus. And then I want you to think, kind of, what led up to, to that? What brought you to that decision, that decision of belief? The word believe is uh, a word that's common throughout the Gospel of John. And it's central to the theme of the Gospel. And the Gospel, again, is the good news. And it's the good news about Jesus. Not just good news that it was nice and cool this morning, uh, warmed up this afternoon here, but boy, that's just good news, right? No, that's, that's okay news. The good news is the good news about Jesus, who he is, what he's done, uh, what he's done for you, and what he's yet continuing to do. And so to believe, then, means to receive something. And so what you believe about uh, important decisions, but what you believe about everything about you is foundational to, to who you are. Uh, what you believe is how you live your life. We become children of God. Uh, we become adopted into the family of God through belief. It's belief in Jesus. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit then indwells us. And he begins this transformation process that lasts throughout our lives called sanctification. And have you ever thought something to be true and then you found out <laughs> that it wasn't? 
and you actually changed your mind about something. Now I know that's that's difficult to do. It goes against human standards, really. Uh, we don't like to admit that we were wrong about something. Uh, but what prompts a change in thinking? It comes back to and resides in the facts. It's the facts about something. Something that we understand. Maybe we didn't understand it before, but then we come to fully understand it. And so then that belief is where we come to belief in uh, Jesus. We become children of God by believing who Jesus is and, and what he's done. John chapter 1, verse 7, we're going to read several of those later, but just in that one verse, it says that John the Baptist came to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. John came that he would bear witness, he would tell the truth, he would express himself about the light, who is Jesus, and that people would come to believe in Jesus through him. Now, fast forward that, you know, a little over 2,000 years or 2,000 years, and modern day believers, you and I today, that's really what God has for us. He intends on us being a witness about the light. Now, we can't be a witness about the light without the light. But once we have the light, we're to tell the truth about the light and what the light's doing in our lives so that others can enjoy the light, which is Jesus. Now, John the Baptist is referred to as a, as a front runner, a forerunner. Uh, he was one that had, had came to uh, share about Jesus. He came uh, bringing the good news uh, earlier on in the other Gospels, we see angels come as messengers, and they're bringing the good news about Jesus. Hark the herald angels sing, right? And so here we see John the Baptist, who was a physical man, who came heralding, who came bringing this good news. Now, we all know, if you read the scripture at all, that you know that John the Baptist was unique, right? He ate locusts, he ate honey, he dressed in camel's hair, he was quite different than the norm. But that didn't bother him because his main purpose was to share about Jesus. And so we can take some pointers from John, now maybe... You don't want to eat locusts and honey. Uh, honey's not so bad, but uh, and maybe you don't want to wear camel's hair and and uh, stand on the street corners. But are you a witness to Jesus, and and not just verbally, but with your lifestyle as well? And it knows that prayed for, helped you find the light, what was their willingness like? How did their relationship with Jesus influence you? Now, I'm not sure if you've ever shared your faith with a non-believer before, that you've ever shared somebody, shared Jesus with somebody. Uh, I'm not sure if you're comfortable to do that. Uh, if not, I would encourage you to think about what would make you comfortable in doing that. And it's not, well, I don't know enough, or I don't have the right words, or I, you know, it, it's really back to our belief system. Do we really, really believe what Jesus did for us? And if we really believe what he did is true and it's for us, then why would we not want to 
share that with others. And really one of the most effective ways of telling people about Jesus is just to share your story. Uh, years ago, uh, 30 years ago or so, I was I went to Mexico several times on the missions trip with some group from uh, the church and the missionary said, you know, unless, uh, before you come, you know, I want you to write your story. What was your life like before Jesus? How, how did you come to know Jesus? And then how is your life different now that you, you know Jesus? And he said, you've got to be able to put it, you know, on a, almost like a five by seven size of paper, not a, not a half sheet, but it doesn't have to be a lot, but it needs to be pointed towards you, not a generic testimony, but a personal testimony. And so we filled those out, uh, sent them down there to him. He translated them all into Spanish and then made multiple copies of them. And when we went out door to door at that point, uh, we would go with some of the local ones from the church there. And as they communicated with others about us coming to share Jesus with them, they had our testimonies and they would share our lives with those that were at the door that they were talking to or on the street corner or wherever they were at. And it was interesting because of that, then uh, people were willing to, to hear the gospel. And it's uh, kind of an amazing thing to think that my testimony or the testimony of the other guys that went with us in that group was shared Others heard and believed in Jesus because they believed it true for us. And so that's that's a witness. That's, that's the testimony. It's not so difficult that you have to lead somebody through the, the whole Bible and try to explain, you know, all these different terms to them. It's, what was your life like before Jesus? How did you come to Jesus? And what has Jesus done in your life since you came to him. So your life shouldn't be the same once we accept Jesus. It should be different. How, how is your life different because of the relationship with Jesus? Well, that's what we're going to talk about this evening is that belief. And so the Gospel of John shows us that uh, really we are dependent upon God. And God is the one who even helps us believe, and we help, he helps us to believe through experience as we grow in our, in our faith. Uh, we talked about that after the Bible study at church last night. We were kind of sitting there talking around a little bit, and before you knew it, that's when we got into that conversation of things that had happened in your life that caused you to believe even more. When you see God provide, you trust him in those areas. And, and I don't mean just financially. I mean, uh, it could be health. It could be just uh, physically. It could be on a trip. It could be uh, on a test. I mean, just multiple ways. And so we need to come to the point of, of understanding what belief is, that we can share that belief. In John chapter 1, uh, 6 through 8, and we're going to start reading there this evening. John 1, 6 through 8. So there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now this is not John the apostle that wrote the gospel. This is John the Baptist, two different Johns. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light but he came to bear witness to the light. So John the Baptist lived in the wilderness. He wore camel's hair clothing. He ate locusts and honey. He was a prophet. And really, the main purpose that God sent him for, it says God sent a man... His name is John. God sent John to tell people about Jesus' coming. 
I'm thinking your name might not be John, but God has sent you to tell people about Jesus' coming. And so we can only share what we know. We can only share what we believe. And of course I'm talking about what we share and believe about Jesus. And so as we grow in our relationship with him, as we as our faith grows, then we really we have more to share because we've been able to see God do different things throughout our life. And a lot of that time that experience comes with uh, years, comes with, with age. And so we need to identify people in our lives that have helped bring us to Jesus, who have helped grow us in a relationship with Jesus, who have strengthened our walk with Jesus, that's what John the Baptist did. That, that's his example. And so your example, it might be it might be parents, it might be grandparents, uh, neighbors, uh, church people, uh, extended family members. Uh, boy, the list can just go on and on and on. It's just, but but who is that that brings that to you? And then not only do you identify these people, but you can identify events and times and places. And you may not remember the exact hour that these things took place. And you might not even remember the day. And as you get older, you might not even remember the year. But you remember them. And you share them. And those experiences that you've had is what has grown your faith and then helps encourage others in their faith. These are called milestones. I I spoke last week about shadow boxes. Uh, we, there was a citywide garage sale here in Ottawa last week, and Shelly saw some online, and before she could get there, somebody bought those shadow boxes. I hope it was one of you uh, that you got them picked up so that you can start <clears throat> making a shadow box of your experiences, of your faith journey, how that grows. That's a that's a wonderful way to help with uh, young believers, whether they're young in age or just young believers, to to put those things in. What brought you to Jesus? And put something that reminds you of that. Um, what's a great thing that you've experienced through that? Well, probably more than likely. Uh, baptism uh, by immersion uh, that's a huge thing and so you can have a little bottle of water in there you know it, it's not the water it's the relationship with Jesus but that reminds you of what that was and then these experiences that you uh, have, have lived and, and, I, and hopefully your shadow box won't be completely full because you're not done in growing your relationship with the Lord. It, it, there still should be time to be able to add other things to it. Um, I'm not where I was when I accepted Jesus, but I'm not where I'm going to be when he calls me home. So I may have come a ways, but I've got a ways to go, and each one of us are, are just like that. So John the Baptist is uh, he, he's a pretty well-known uh person in the New Testament, uh, his lifespan in Scripture doesn't last very long from the time he, uh, well, back that up, I guess. Uh, his birth was unique as well. Um, the angels came and told his mother and father, uh, it's that John, that uh, Elizabeth was going to be present, pregnant uh, Zechariah didn't believe, so he couldn't speak then until after the baby was born, and they named him John. You don't hear much about John throughout the rest of his life there until Jesus comes on the scene, and he's a precursor for Jesus, and he comes in the wilderness. He was a prophet. He had a unique mission. Uh, 
We all have unique missions. We all have unique purposes. But in the grand scheme of things, it really is to be a witness for Jesus. His early years are just lived in the wilderness uh, where he grew in his relationship with the Lord. And the final point of his ministry is when he comes onto the scene and he starts proclaiming that others repent. If there was a word, if John the Baptist had a shadow box, you know, he'd have a little angel over here that came and spoke to his parents. He might have his parents. He might have uh, a special birth. He might have some camel's hair in there. Um, hopefully not a live locust, but he could have a locust in there and some, a little jar of honey. Uh, somewhere in that shadow box would be this word repent. If there was something that you would be uh, really connected to with John the Baptist, that would be that word. That's what he came to do. He came to call others to repentance through faith in Jesus Christ. And so that's what um, it's about. And so if you look back at, if you got your Bibles open or your phone, wherever you're looking at it, uh, on John chapter 1, 6 through 8, John had a role to fill. And that role was to be a witness. Now he might have done a lot of other things as well. Uh, he might have uh, been a great uh, hiker, right? He, he lived in the wilderness. He might have been uh, uh, be able to pick up and tear down camp in the shortest amount of time. A lot of things he could have been able to do. He could have been very um, athletic because of his amount of walking that he did. But those are just sub-things of what he was really called to do, which was called to have them repent. But he did say he was not the light. It, it, it didn't, it, it, it wasn't too much for him. He didn't think he was doing too much. He didn't go to his head. He wasn't the light, but he came to bear witness to the light. And so he was going to tell people about Jesus. Now today you don't hear people called God's prophets. Uh, and so I'm not saying that you are a prophet, but I am saying that you are called, just like me, to bear witness about Jesus. To tell others about the good news. Tell others the gospel. And so we can learn a lot from John the Baptist about what he did and that that was his God-given purpose and he utilized that to the fullest. John the Baptist wasn't to make a name for himself. He knew that it was Jesus and about Jesus and he just wanted to bring others to Jesus. Lots of times people ask him, you know, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? No, I'm, I'm not. I'm not the light. Uh, I'm not the one. Later on in John, he says, behold, the Lamb of God. The one you're looking for is Jesus. And so John's role and our role in the kingdom is, is crucial. It has, a, it has a super purpose. And we get so caught up in our worlds today that we miss our purpose because of all the things that we're doing. And these doing things are what we think we're called to be about when really we're called to be a witness for Jesus. And so God can use any avenue, he can use anything to draw people to himself. Uh, throughout scripture he used he used uh, dead, dry bones. He used a uh, donkey. He used, you know, multiple things. But today he chooses to use you and I. Not because we're worthy, but because he has a purpose and plan for us. It draws us together for that. 
in Romans chapter 10, that's a couple books to your right from uh, the, the Gospel of John. In Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 9, it says, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. And then verse 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Hearing that word is from someone sharing that testimony, that gospel, that story about Jesus with them. And everybody that hears that has an opportunity then to, to make that difference and to to share. I was going to read one more verse here and I, I close by Romans 10. I should have stayed there. Sorry about that. Romans 10, 14 to 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Those verses should encourage us. It should encourage us to evangelism. I, I hear so many people so many times say, well, I'm just not an evangelist. I just can't do that. That's what we're called to do. You, you may not stand on the pulpit and preach to thousands of people, but we're all called to at least talk to one. And so that should change our views on how we even do missions. What are our missionaries doing? Are they playing games with kids or are they sharing the gospel with families? There's a big difference in, in missionaries even. And so to believe in something, I said earlier, is to receive it. And so we've got to we've got to hear the word of God to be able to receive that and then to believe it. And through the gospel of Jesus then The gospel of Jesus has to be communicated to people so that they can receive it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 says that God equips, he equips people to be preachers and evangelists and pastors and teachers to, to communicate the word, and, and he does, and there are a lot of those, but he calls every one of us to the same thing. And those preachers and teachers and evangelists and pastors and leaders are to equip the body to do the work of the ministry, which means to share the gospel. And so when we encounter Jesus in our lives, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us, and then we have his presence in our lives. And if you really believe it, and you believe that to be true, the natural response is to tell somebody. It's kind of like, how many of you like to be the first person to be able to tell somebody about something? Uh, unfortunately, sometimes that's called gossip. But not when you talk about Jesus, right? And so wouldn't it be great if somebody just came up to you and said, man, you wouldn't believe what Jesus has been doing in my life lately. You believe how I've seen him provide for this or that instead of grumbling or complaining. That whatever's going on in your life, 
Whatever you're excited about, it's what you're going to tell others. If it's gossip, that, that's what you're going to tell them. If it's um, about a new car or a new house or a new dog or cat or bird or, uh, I mean, yeah, new flower, whatever you're excited about, you're going you're gonna to talk about it. And you don't have to know everything about it, but you're still going to talk about it. And so what we need to get to the point in our lives is that we're that excited about Jesus that we're sharing him to others. Now, I know when John the Baptist came, he didn't say, Woe is me, I gotta tell others about Jesus. You're not gonna believe it, but he's coming. I'm not, I don't think that's gonna bring too many people into the kingdom, do you? It's gonna be kind of sad to, to think about that. But, the truth be told, when when we see him working in our lives and we're excited about it and we share that, people are drawn to that. They're drawn to that point of, of what's going on. In John chapter 4, we find the woman at the well. John chapter 5, John chapter 6. Each one of these chapters had multiple things in it that without really a full good grasp of the very first chapter of John, we miss what's going on in the rest of those chapters. As believers, it should be our, it's a duty, but it's a privilege to tell others about Jesus. You don't have to have a seminary degree. You don't have to have the Bible memorized from front to back. You don't have to have eloquent speech. Enough to win a debate. You don't have to have that. The most effective way to communicate about Jesus is from your faith. Faith, the Bible says, is supposed to be living and active. That's what scripture is. That's what our faith is. And to share what Jesus has done for you and how your life is better because you have Jesus in your life. Now do you consider it a privilege? I hope so. I would encourage you to think about it in that way. And then ask, ask God to help you have opportunities to, to share your good news about Jesus. To share what Jesus is doing in your life. That's why I always encourage you to share these messages on your Facebook page or your story so that others can see them. They might just ask you about them. And even if they don't, you can go ahead and say, hey, you know what? You know what I'm learning from the Gospel of John? That's a privilege to be able to share my story with you. And I'm excited about it. Hey, let me tell you something. And then just go right in to tell them something that Jesus is doing. In the Gospel of John, if you move on down to verse 12, chapter 1, verse 12, First, we talked about John and how he came so that others could, that he bear witness. He was sent by God. His name was John. He was to bear witness about the light and that others might come to know the light through him, right? And so in verse 12, it says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, his, in that instance, is speaking of Jesus. But to all who did receive Jesus, who believed in Jesus' name, Jesus gave the right to become children of God. John the Baptist saw it as a privilege. You can call it evangelism. You can call it witnessing. You can call it sharing testimony. 
You can call it whatever you want. But what he did was tell people about Jesus so that they'd have an opportunity to either accept or reject to believe in Jesus. And he knew that by believing, then, they would have life in Jesus' name because Jesus is the one who brings life. And all people are separated from God because of our sin, right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And the wages of sin is death. But God provided Christ so that we don't have to stay there. We don't have to dwell there. We don't have to live there. The light has come. The light shines. The light illuminates the darkness. I've got the candle lit this evening so you can see that it pushes away the darkness. And that's what Jesus does. When the light of Christ shines in the darkness, people believe. And not only do they believe, but then they become children of God. Are all people children of God? No, all people are created in God's image. He gives us an opportunity. It's not automatic because of what Jesus has done. And so what's at stake for those who are not children of God? Well, Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Not just physical death, but eternal separation, gnashing of teeth, and pain and torment throughout an eternity. So those who reject the light of Jesus are not children of God. Yeah, you're right. God created everyone. We can go back to Genesis and see that. All human beings are made in his image. And he made them male and female. Two. He made them. We don't choose. He made us what we are to fulfill a purpose that he's given us, our God-given purpose. But just because he created us doesn't mean that we know God the Father. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. So the only way to the Father is through the Son, and the Son is Jesus. And I know you hear all over the place nowadays, there are many paths to God. That's not true. That's a deceptive lie from the enemy that wants people to truly believe that that's true. God. John's gospel does demonstrates that that is, that is a falsehood. That's a lie. Some people say it's unfair that Jesus is the only way. I think it's pretty fair that God even gave us a way. And that way is Jesus. Yeah, it's exclusive. But it comes by faith. It comes by perceiving. And it comes by believing. And in John chapter 8, if you're back in John 1, you can flip over a couple chapters there to get to John chapter 8. Verse 34 through 36. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son has set you free, you are free indeed. So that passage says that if we're not children of God, then we're slaves. And we're slaves to sin. And so there's only... There's only two possibilities for mankind. Our sin separates us from God. Without God 
providing a way out, we would remain in our sin and find death. A slave has no permanent standing in the master's house. Only a child does. And so in the father's house, there's only a child of God that does. And when it comes to what we believe about Jesus, there's a lot at stake, including our eternal destiny. In John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. Verse 10 goes on to say, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. What we have is death. We have an opportunity for life, but that's only in Jesus. Apart from Jesus, we're slaves to sin. And see, that's what we get today. Sin is unpopular in our culture. We don't like to admit that we're wrong. We don't like to admit that we might not be headed in the right direction. We don't, we don't like to admit that we might have to have help from God to get out of a situation or a circumstance. And we don't even like to admit that we're sinners because whatever answer we have, whatever path we want to take, whatever we want to do, that's who we are and what we are. And that kind of life leads to a realization that you don't need a Savior. You're almost it yourself. You have become a God. But we do need a Savior. Because the wages of sin is death. In Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, it says, The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. And heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The Holy Spirit assures us whether we are believers or not. The Holy Spirit would never tell you anything that would contradict what Scripture says. When we try to find our own path to eternity, to God, to the purpose for our life, and it's apart from Scripture, we can guarantee that that's, that's not truth. That's deceptive division from the enemy. The Holy Spirit will communicate with you, and the truth only comes through, through God's Word. And it's not picking one verse here and one verse there. It's collectively together how those Scriptures work. And so are, are you confident that you're a child of God this evening? Why? Or why not? It, 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 only you've got that answer. If, if you're a child of God, then you're a co-heir with Christ, and all that God has, all that God owns, that's an inheritance to you. Everything in this world, everything in this life, everything in eternity belongs to God. And so that means that as, as a child of God, you're no longer a slave to sin. That doesn't mean we don't struggle with sin. It just means that we have a way out. He gives us the power to overcome that. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, 
to see what kind of love the Father has given us. That we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why this world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Do you know Him this evening? Truly know Him. Not just deceived into thinking that you are or you thought it automatically came to you. But as we close out this evening, I'd encourage you to to give thanks to God that he has given you Jesus. He's provided the only way that you can become a child of God. But he provided it for you. And he provided a way where you can be set free from your sins and you can become a co-heir with his one and only son, Jesus Christ. And that you can look forward to spending eternity with him. Does belief matter? You bet it does. But a proper belief matters even more. And so we have to make sure of what we're believing and why we're believing it. And so this evening we're going we're to close out here. Uh, we're, gonna, we're excited about what Jesus is doing. I encourage you to share this on your page. Share this on your story. Share whatever's going on in your life with others around you. Share the truth of Jesus. And if you need to know Jesus, if you're not walking in a path that's going to lead you to Jesus, let, let me know. Message me, email me, text me, whatever it is, to where we can, we can talk and communicate. I can help walk you through if you need be. It's important. And your belief matters not only to you, but to those you come in contact with. We're going to close out there this evening. Uh, we love having you guys join us on Wednesday night and taking part in these studies. And hopefully it's helping you grow in your faith and your relationship with Jesus. As we get out of here this evening, we always give you an opportunity to take part in the ministries. You can give through uh, online on the webpage or through Facebook. You can text to give. You can mail a check to the church, put attention to Linda on it, and that helps those ministries that we're a part of. We have a lot of those that are out there sharing the gospel of Jesus in the way that they know how. And you're helping fund those entities that are able to do that. And so with that this evening, we're going to get out of here. We thank you for joining us again. Share it on your page, whether you watch it tonight or in the nights to come. Think about your own testimony that I shared earlier. What were you like before Jesus? What brought you to Jesus? And what's your life like now? Your life now should not be like your life before. There should be a transformation, at least a beginning process of it. And so with that this evening, we're going to get out of here. We love you guys. So enjoy being able to share these messages with you as well. So if you need anything other than that, hey, let me know. If, if you, other than that, we'll see you uh, Sunday morning, if not before. Good night.